If you're looking for a website or domain, then check out today's sponsor, Squarespace. Hello again everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. Recently I published this video, addressing claims made by Flatsoid about how he thinks focal length works. He'd previously claimed that using a longer focal length lens will cause the background of images to be pushed down, in an attempt to explain away the photograph of Blackpool that demonstrates Earth curvature. And he tried to back that claim up by citing a video from the YouTube channel Photography Online, which at one point in their video shows two images side by side, one shot at a 12mm focal length and the other shot at 200mm, and the 200mm photo has no mountain visible in the background, which Flatsoid attributes to lens compression, apparently causing an entire mountain to completely disappear from view. Even though Photography Online themselves confirmed in the comment section that the photos were taken from different heights, they also, in the video, included a 100mm shot within the comparison, in which the mountain is still clearly visible, and later on in the video they talk about how lens compression doesn't actually exist. So the myth that longer focal lengths compress a scene, and shorter focal lengths exaggerate a scene, is totally false. And Flatsoid himself has publicly stated in that stream that these are experts in photography and people shouldn't disagree with them. And by the way, <laughs> Photography Online is a whole bunch of experts. Not just one guy, they're a team of experts. They are really good at what they do, so if you're saying they're wrong, then there's something wrong with you. Even though he's now disagreeing with them. So, I decided to tackle his claims by setting up a blind test for him. I took a drive out to Pennington Flash Nature Reserve, and with my camera put on a tripod, I took four photos of an information board next to a lake, and in the background is a sailing club located over a kilometre away. I then presented these photos in my video, but I intentionally gave no details about which images were shot at which focal length. The only information I gave was that the focal lengths used were 20, 40, 70 and 180 millimeters, that I'd selected apertures which would give each image a similar amount of background blur, and that I'd compressed each image down to give similar clarity because cropping into a wide angle shot would inherently degrade the image quality and thus make it easier to spot. Now, I did realise afterwards there were two small issues with the test that I presented, but I'll cover them later on. In reality, I wasn't actually expecting Flatsoid to even attempt the test. I mean, despite the issues that we'll cover later, let's be honest, Ray Charles wearing a welding mask in a room with no lights on could see that the same background is visible in all four images, which immediately destroys Flatsoid's original claim that such a long focal length lens would cause an entire mountain to disappear from view. But, credit to Flatsoid, he's thrown caution to the wind and publicly has presented an attempt at doing the test. Although, judging by his responses in the comments to his video, he's already moving the goalposts, it seems. Away from, it makes an entire mountain disappear, to, these few pixels look slightly different. But it's clear to all that these four photos are pretty much identical. I mean, at first glance, you'd be forgiven for thinking it's the same image, just copied and pasted. And trying to find valid differences to tell them apart based purely on focal length would present quite a headache. Granted, not as much of a headache as I've been having trying to come up with a good segue for the sponsor of this video. Thankfully, though, you won't have to deal with any headaches if you're in need of a website, because you can just visit Squarespace. It's easy to use website builder makes getting a professional looking website an absolute breeze. Select from one of the hundreds of amazing looking templates available, then set to work customizing it to suit your style and add some or all of the great features available, such as photos and video galleries, send out emails to all of your subscribers at the touch of a button, sell your goods or services and manage orders and payments through an online store, or set up an online schedule so people can view your availability day by day to book appointments with you. Don't take my word for it though, see how Squarespace can help you today by getting a completely free trial using my link in the description and get 10% off your first website purchase by using the, my code Dave McKeegan at checkout. Now there were actually quite a few people who posted guesses in the comment section of my video about which images they thought were which, and the responses varied a lot. In fact, I think pretty much every possible combination of answers made an appearance at some point. 
But one common thing I noticed about those that explain their reasoning was that they seemed to be basing it on how blurred the background was as opposed to the position of the objects in the background. And it seems even Flatsoid was doing that to some extent as well. And that's going to be important to remember shortly. His method for this was to layer each photo over the top left image and then shift the opacity back and forth to see if he could see any differences between them. And his final answers were 180 millimeters for the top left, 70 millimeters for the top right, 20 millimeters for the bottom left and 40 millimeters for the bottom right. Which isn't bad. He's half right. The bottom images are indeed 20mm left and 40mm right, but he's got the top images back to front. Especially considering if we look at what Flatsoid has done to compare up all the images, he's drawn a bunch of grid lines across all of the photos, and then he's put two boxes in each one next to some trees. But the boxes for the lower images are a different size and in a different position compared to the boxes at the top. So here he seems to be comparing the bottom two images to each other and the top two images to each other, but not directly comparing the top two images to the bottom two images. Now, despite his method failing to correctly identify all four focal lengths, I'm fairly sure he will still try and chalk it up as a win, because he basically already has before I've even published this video with him seemingly shifting his claims away from saying what he was with the photography online video, that at 200 millimeters an entire mountain would disappear plain as day, to now there are minute differences at a pixel level between the images which you can only see by drawing reference markers. However, Flatsoid has basically managed to debunk himself and proved just how similar the photos are by making rather an unfortunate oversight. Because like I said, his method for this was to overlay each image onto the top left photo and then shift the opacity back and forth. The top left photo, which we now know is the 70mm photo. Except when he's placed the 180mm shot over it, at some point he's managed to inadvertently leave the opacity at full. Which means the 70mm photo that I took is not actually visible in his final comparison. He's instead trying to show the differences between two identical copies of the 180mm photo, seemingly without even realising. They're the same picture. And I will leave it to you as individuals to decide how poetic it is that it is the top left that he's done that to. Now, speaking of screw-ups, as I mentioned earlier, there were two small issues with the images I presented in that test, which arguably could have made things a bit easier to determine which was which focal length. I only realised about these afterwards, but the first minor issue was that I'd aimed to shoot every image with the lens aperture having a diameter of about 10mm in order to try and create similar amounts of background blur, because telephoto lenses inherently make it easier to create shallower depths of field, which would then make them easier to recognise. So a 10mm aperture for a 180mm focal length would mean shooting at f18. However, after I'd published the video, I realised that when I was taking the pictures, I must have accidentally caught the aperture dial, because that photo actually ended up being shot at f16, which is marginally wider and would create slightly more background blur. The bigger issue, though, I hit was for each image, I was aiming to have the focus on the edge of the information board. However, the 20mm shot was taken with a 20mm Takina lens and doesn't have great autofocus. And I only noticed afterwards when I got the, computer, the images back on my computer that either the lens is slightly missed focus, it looks like it's possibly focused a bit too far, either that or it could be the bokeh, which is the quality of the autofocus renderings, does vary a lot from lens to lens. It's one thing a lot of photographers tend to look at, how well does a lens render out of focus areas. However, many people did seem to correctly identify the 20mm shot based on the background looking clearer, which ultimately would have been an unfortunate coincidence if it's a misfocusing issue. Because had that error occurred with the 70mm lens, then that could have caused people to wrongly presume that that was shot with the 20mm or had the 20mm lens been focused too close rather than too far, that would actually increase the background blur and then potentially trick people into thinking it was shot with a longer focal length. And Flatsoid himself picked up on the fact that the background looked clearer and concluded that that was the 20mm shot. And then looked very carefully at all the uh, 
field of view differences based on the backgrounds and obviously you can see the bottom here has uh, a much um, clearer uh, less distorted background compared to the others and as you can go along you can see that one's a bit less distorted than there and a bit less distorted and that's the most distorted one they're the same picture also, in setting myself the aim of keeping the same physical aperture, I heavily restricted my choice of focal lengths, especially given that I was trying to include a very wide-angle lens. For example, I have lenses that cover focal lengths from 11mm all the way up to 500 However, if I'd used the 11mm lens, that only has a maximum aperture of f4, which is a, a th less than 3mm diameter. And most lenses don't let you go lower than f18 or f22 in the aperture ratio. Meaning, if I'd used the 11mm lens in my comparison at f4, the longest focal length I could have then used to keep the same depth of field would have been only 60mm, which I thought Flatsoid probably would have challenged because the Photography Online video was using a 200mm because they weren't bothered about keeping the same depth of field and that he might have then tried to argue that a 60mm focal length isn't long enough to see a difference, just like how he tried to argue that 4 meters across a room wasn't a long enough distance to see any difference when I presented my toy car comparison from one of my old videos. But I was reluctant to go with a l too long a focal length due to an issue I talked about in my previous video, that for me to go with a focal length longer than 180mm, would have required me to use my Tamron 150 to 500 millimeter lens, which is a very heavy lens. And having this hanging off my camera with my camera attached to the tripod, firstly, it could risk damaging the camera, but also it would cause the lens to dip down slightly. And if I'd mounted the lens itself onto the tripod using the tripod collar, then that would have moved the camera slightly further away and higher up compared to the other images, which would then have potentially caused a shift in perspective between all the photos. And for a blind test, four images probably wasn't ideal, because that still leaves reasonable odds of guessing at least one of them correct just by blind luck. Flatsoid was half right, or half wrong, depending on how you want to look at it. His original hypothesis was that he could tell photos apart by focal length based just on the movement of the background. He correctly identified the 20mm and 40mm. Perhaps that was actually due to longer focal lengths moving objects around, or perhaps it was because the 20mm shot was slightly misfocused in the right direction to fortunately make it stand out correctly for people who were looking for a more in-focus background. Perhaps he then got the 40mm correct by fluke because it just happened to be next to the 20mm shot and that it was the next focal length in the sequence. I mean, maybe he would have correctly identified the 70 and 180mm photos were he not trying to compare two copies of the same photo instead. Unfortunately, now it's too late to know for sure because we know which focal lengths are which. It's like Schrodinger's cat. But it's okay, because this is science. We can learn from mistakes and we can seek to do things better. And as it's nearly Christmas, I have a present for Flatzoid and for everyone else as well, because I've been back down to Pennington Flash and I've redone the test, but this time I've done it better. For starters, I've made sure that each photo is correctly focused this time, and I also found a way around the focal length limitations as well. By using two tripods, I've been able to include the 150 to 500 millimeter lens without needing to worry about moving the camera. So rather than having images ranging from 20 millimeter f2 up to 180 millimeters, this time I've gone from 35 millimeter f1.8 all the way up to 425 millimeters f22. Now, if 200 millimeters can make an entire mountain disappear from view, I can only imagine what 400mm will do, so surely it should not be that difficult to tell them apart. And I thought, I'm not going to skimp out and just do four different focal lengths. Since it's Christmas, I've gone with 12. I will bring them all up one by one now full screen so you can see them clearly. They're in no particular order, and I will clarify that like last time, these are all shot at a different focal length, 
Each shot is at a respective F number to give as close to a similar depth of field as I can. And like last time, not only have I cropped in each image to the same depth of field, but I've also compressed the images down to try and give similar levels of clarity. Because obviously the text on the information board is going to look much more legible when viewed with a 400mm lens versus with a 35mm lens. I'm not going to bore you with the specific focal lengths and aperture combinations for all 12 images. I'm just going to present the images numbered 1 to 12. Again, in no particular order, and see if anybody wants to have a go putting them in the correct order based on their focal length from shortest to longest. I'm sure Flatzoid will probably still try and claim that he is correct because these photos aren't an exact pixel match, which they're not, but that has nothing to do with lens compression. For starters, every single photo here is taken with a lens that uses round optics, which naturally want to try and project circular images. But lens manufacturers want them projecting straight lines to look like straight lines. So they use many pieces of glass within the lens to try and control the light the way they want to get straighter images. However, more accurate control of this requires more complicated lens designs, which then makes things more expensive. It's generally why fisheye lenses are smaller than similar focal length rectilinear lenses, because they're playing into the natural circular distortion of the optics rather than trying to correct for them. Anyway, all of that means most lenses don't project a perfectly distortion-free image, and often the distortion characteristics vary from lens to lens. In fact, Distortion characteristics of zoom lenses often change throughout the zoom range as the optics move around. But even if every lens had the exact same distortion profile, the distortion emanates from the center lines of the image out towards the corners. The longest focal length here, you're seeing the entire image. For every other photo though, it's being cropped in more and more, which means we're seeing less and less of the distorted areas. But an odd pixel here and there for an object almost a mile away in the background does not come close to explaining the apparent disappearance of an entire mountain or even the drastic drop of an entire row of mountains compared to Blackpool Tower, which was what his claim was supposed to be. In reality, if his claim were true and longer focal lengths did cause distant objects to drop down the further away they were, I would not be able to use my telescope. Because... That thing's a 1500mm focal length. I cannot just point that thing at a particular star by just eyeballing it. Instead, I need to use the spotter scope that's fitted on the top. But I need to ensure that the spotter scope is correctly aligned with the main scope. Now to do that, I aim the telescope at something during the day. Usually a TV aerial or a chimney of a house down the street and I will then tweak my spotter scope to get the crosshairs of that aiming at whatever is in the center of my telescope. If Flatsoid's claim were true, the moment I then take that scope out at night and point it into the sky at objects much further away, the longer focal length of the telescope would push objects down more than the spotter scope, which would then mean if I aimed my spotter scope to get a particular star visible in the center, when I look through the main scope, I shouldn't be able to see a damn thing, which obviously is not what happens. Although ironically, Flatsoid has since cited a video by The Slanted Lens, who did the exact same experiment of taking photos from a fixed position at different focal lengths, and then cropped each image in to get the same fields of view, and they openly concluded the backgrounds are identical and the focal length makes no difference. Yeah. But the relationship of my brother to the background stays exactly the same. Mm -hmm. That's simply because I've cropped in. I'm not... Yeah, because it's cropped in, exactly. But look what's going to happen. Change the relationship of my background to my foreground. So when you zoom, you can't change the relationship of the background to the foreground. It always stays the same. Yeah, because of zooming. And the whole time, Flatzoid is nodding along in agreement and not challenging what they're saying. So it seems to me like he's simultaneously trying to claim that longer focal lengths causes an entire mountain to disappear, and yet makes no difference to the backgrounds whatsoever. But anyway, that's going to draw this video to a close. Feel free to leave your guesses for the 12 images in the comments below if you want to. If you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.